guilty as charged. No, I don't. I'm much too busy um, to, to engage into one more channel of communication. I use the internet a lot. I use email, but that's where it stops. I don't tweet, I don't Facebook, I don't do the other interesting things other people do. Well, it depends on where, you see. Um, in places where you have a, a very broad media scene and a functioning democratic system, um, what social media do, they just expand the area of what's already there. Um, they allow more people to join in the debate more easily, whatever. Um, I'm not terribly sure if this radically alters the nature of the media system, let alone the political system. Uh, it might in perspective. Uh, the, the current problem with social media, of course, is that there is no review of the contents. Therefore, you do not know if you can trust what you get on social media. But the same was true of um, quote-unquote classical media. I mean, the 19th century uh, American local media often publish stories with the lead, interesting if true, right? And eventually they got to produce the New York Times. So there's hope at that end. Uh, in unfree countries, uh, social media play an important role in circumventing censorship, allowing for instant communication. And this goes, of course, beyond just information. It can also mobilize. But um, there's a problem. Uh, social media pass on information. They do not build strong relationships based on trust, which still necessitate a face-to-face -face encounter. Uh, I was active in underground printing. Uh, I published an underground newspaper in Poland in the 80s. And one of the things that made the Polish underground media so successful and so important was the fact that when, when somebody gave you an underground publication, you didn't only receive the physical object and its contents, you also received an obligation. You received a message that there's somebody at the other end of the chain who's risking his freedom so that you can know what's happening in your country, right? So, as, at the very least, you wouldn't throw it away after reading it. You'd pass it on to somebody else and this already was a small act of resistance. But after a couple of times, you might actually want to do more. You maybe want to contribute some money that you can pass on to the person from whom you got the underground publication. And eventually, you actually might want to do something. By that time, a relationship of trust is already established between you and the distributor. Most of the underground structures in Poland in the 80s were built around distribution of newspapers. Now, this is not something um, that Facebook or Twitter can provide. This is not a criticism. They have huge advantages, but this one thing they cannot give. And until now, it has been consistently the case in human history that people do not act together if they do not trust together. And trust is still a physical thing, a question of looking at somebody's face and then making the decision. You can't really make up your mind about trusting or not um, an avatar on the internet. Which is the reason why, while giving the opposition advantages in many cases, social media also put the opposition at a disadvantage, because they privilege the kind of facile, rapid, immediate contact of the more time-consuming but indispensable process of building trust and building structures. If you rely only on them, yes, absolutely. Belarus is a case in point. Uh, in Belarus, they have a very developed system of communication through social media. Yet, they are not able to produce a systematic structured movement that would oppose the regime. And they do not have underground print media. Although next door in Poland, they've got an entire country full of people who know how you get it done, right? And 
if it remains at this level, Lukashenko well, can sleep safely. The more so as only 18% of the Belarusians have regular access to the internet. One thing underground print media do is they're genuinely egalitarian. You don't need to belong to a privileged group like internet users to have access to them. So ultimately, sitting at your keyboard and happily clicking away is an autistic activity. It may give you catharsis, it may give you fun, it may give you information. It does not make you part of a movement. And when you feel that way, that because you've clicked on something on your screen, you become part of a movement, you got it wrong. It, it, it's like um, cyber sex. People tell me it's great, um, possibly, but it kind of misses the point. No, uh, it wasn't overestimated. Social media clearly did what they can do. They mobilized large groups of people at the same time. They disseminated information. But frankly, I don't believe the Egyptian revolution would have been possible if not for the fact that different movements were organizing patiently for years. The mosques, the trade unions, the WACF, number of movements were out there. Yes, they availed themselves of the possibilities provided by social media, but there was genuine, solid organization work that preceded it. As opposed to, say, Tehran, the Green Revolution, which was a spontaneous outburst of outrage, which heavily relied on social media, and social media could not provide it with the solidity, the backbone, the organizational structure that you need to fight a regime, which is one of the reasons why it was defeated. My knowledge of the situation in the Palestinian territories isn't as good as it used to be, so I'll be guessing. I think it's very difficult to have an Arab Spring against very incompetent and very authoritarian rulers who rule you when those rulers are at the same time engaged in a struggle against an occupying force that you too want to see overthrown. Um, it must have felt disloyal to do this to Abbas or even to Hamas when they're resisting the Israelis. Um, I think that's the main reason. And the second reason probably is a, a difference of perspective. As you said, the Palestinians have managed to produce a reasonably open democratic society curtailed in Gaza, but I, I, I don't really believe this is the choice of the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, so the fundamental feeling which was behind the successful Arab revolutions is they will ignore us no longer. We will show them that we're here and we have a dignity. The Palestinians don't need to scream that out. Their leaders had recognized it. Otherwise, they would not have been their leaders because the Palestinian movement is much more democratic than the average Arab state in the Middle East. The pressure to do something drastic um, wasn't there to the extent it was for obvious reasons in Egypt, Tunisia, or other places. Mercifully, the government in Poland actually seems to believe that it has no business in interfering where it has no business interfering. Uh, however, we have had a few court cases recently where the tribunals ruled that bloggers are responsible for comments published on their blog by other people. Now, if this holds, this, of course, is a mortal threat to freedom of discussion on the web. And Poland is, of course, not the only place in which a fundamental debate on the status of blogging and other aspects of social media takes place. Um, as an disinterested observer, I don't blog and I don't write on other people's blogs. Um, while recognizing all the reasons which might make the courts rule the way they ruled, I think that by definition, it is always better 
to leave as open a space as possible for democratic discussion and pay the penalty for that than to restrict it and pay the penalty for restriction. Um, it's a kind of knee-jerk, gut-feeling reaction. I'm with the bloggers and not with the tribunals. I feel thrilled, of course. Uh, but this is a middle-aged man reliving his youth, okay? That doesn't tell you much either about the Arab Spring or about what I did 25 years ago. It tells you essentially that I'm not 25 anymore, right? Um, I see obvious analogies on the, on the psychological level. The kind of discourse that we hear um, about dignity, about we are responsible for our country, they do not have the right to speak in our name, is exactly the same language that we had. And it's a language which is absolutely universal. Uh, whoever says that um, human rights are a Western invention, I haven't, I've traveled the world. I haven't met one single person who says that he'd prefer to be deprived of his rights than to have them. People might not exert their rights. It's a different story. I don't think they have any doubts about wanting to have them. So in this sense, this is part of a universal human process. Differences, of course, are huge. Um, we had, we were very lucky in a way. Um, first of all, we could blame all our problems on the foreigner occupier, okay? It's all the Soviets' fault. Uh, it actually took us quite some time in Poland to realize that having a communist party with three million members together with their families, that was one third of the country, is not exactly what you would call, um, well, the Soviets, right? That like any other conflict, this was an internal Polish conflict, um, pitting Poles against Poles with different visions of their country's future. And the fundamental issue of building democracy in Poland after the revolution was to realize that we're not building it for us. We're building it for everybody, our erstwhile enemies included. And um, I, I actually felt proudest, not when we took power in 89, but when we lost the elections in 93 and allowed the communists to take power again, because this is what the citizens wanted, okay? And they took over without a glitch. And it, it was a very weird feeling. They were supposed to be triumphant, right? They were embarrassed because they knew they owe it to us that for the first time in their history, they actually have a legitimacy to rule. Um, in this sense, the test of the Arab Springs will be not this election, the first elections, it'll be the next elections. Uh, but the Arab Spring is unlucky, not only in the sense that dictatorships were internally imposed, even if supported from the outside. It's also unlucky because um, it's 20 years late. When we were able to shake off the communist regime, we had next door a Europe which was politically and financially, financially welcoming and supporting. There was a a goal we could reach, EC membership, and there was support on the way. Uh, I think we would have done it anyway, but it would have been much more difficult. Um, the Arabs cannot count on any kind of European future outside of the vague rhetoric, like kind of which we heard just a moment ago when Stefan Fühle gave his speech. Um, nor can they count on money in a situation of global crisis. Revolutions easily tend to disappointment. The price of food in Egypt has risen 80% since the beginning of the year. Um, you know, Marx had it right at least on one point uh, when he said that existence determines consciousness. If you're hungry, you're not terribly interested about the sophistication of the voting system. You should support the, whoever will give you food to eat. And the, the horrible things we've seen happening in Cairo seem to me a, a clear example of a regime 
whipping up internal conflict to justify its existence preventively acting against social unrest, which would have happened anyway, because you can't afford to buy a loaf of bread. And in this sense, of course, I'm very concerned about the future of, of the Arab Springs. On the other hand, as I said in my presentation, somebody who has witnessed 1989 relinquishes the right to be a pessimist. I mean, in, in common sense, this could not have happened, okay? The, the 20th century most brutal empire giving it up without a war? People overthrowing regimes all over with just one dictator executed? And then everybody happily building a better or worse version of democracy. But even Russia today is much better off, also in political terms, than it was 20 years ago. I mean, give me a break. This is, this is a, a completely unrealistic, lunatic raving in 89. So if you've seen that, if you've seen actually it can happen, the very least you can say that everybody has a chance, okay? Um, the criticism of Arab Spring I hear today is very reminiscent of what I heard about Poland 20 years ago. You guys don't have enough of a democratic tradition. Um, you're a jerry-made country of different bits and pieces. Um, you're economically broke anyway. Um, the, the religious fundamentalists are a threat. All those observations were right. They were simply not right enough. And yes, the criticism you can hear directed at the political process in Egypt or Tunisia is eminently justified. The only point is it's not the entire picture. And um, having seen 89, I cannot refuse myself the hope that the entire picture is much brighter than what we see.